Let's all say amen. amen. I don't know about you. I'm kind of happy right now. <laughs> we ought to be happy when we know that we're blessed. Blessed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're here today to collectively come together in a great crescendo of praise and adoration to Almighty God. For His Word is to be praised. He's good. Yes, He is good. His loving kindness and His mercy endures unto all generations. I'm glad to be here. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be in the midst of the sanctified. Those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So we bless God today. We praise God. And we thank you for being with us today, especially those of you who are our guests. We want you to know that you are, uh, this is not a mere statement, but a heartfelt statement. When we say you are honored guests, and we, we want you to uh, be uninhibited to get your praise on. If God has been good to you, if God has blessed you, if God has delivered you, redeemed you, does some good stuff for you, you want to say amen, you want to praise God. We are here not because we are so good, but because He is so good. Amen. He's been good to me, and He's been good to you. Yes. And so it's not, a, it's not a stretch, it's not a burden, yet it's a privilege to be able to come together as family to express our faith and commitment to our Heavenly Father. Today we are here to not only Render up expressions of thanksgiving to God. Also to be comforted by his people present. For if God indwells you, if God indwells me when we come together, it's just the spirit of Christ Amen. all over this place. Amen. And so we are here to do that. To bless his name and to praise him. Amen. I want to say that as we continue to progress through the theme for this month, a theme that poses the question, a question that many have begun to ask as we try to trivialize and downplay the importance of God. We ask the question, what's the big deal? And we know that people ask that question in different areas and in different ways. So, in the beginning of our theme, we ask the question, what is the big deal as it relates to the church? And we see many who say that the church is not all that important. Give me Jesus, but you can keep the church. Help. Those who say the church uh, it, it, it is not important, we ask the question, what is the big deal? Help. We say that the redeemed are added to the church. That the church uh, is the called out body of believers. Right. So we don't look at the church as brick and mortar. We don't look at the church as having an address of 756 uh, Lion Street. Amen. We look at the church as the spirit of God that indwells his people. Amen. And if we are indeed the called out by the gospel of Christ. We are the church. We are the church. The church is in us. Amen. And we are the church. As we come together to assembly like this, we're at the church. Right. Only because we are the church. Yes. And then we ask the question, what is the big deal as it relates to Christianity? For there are many who will say that you can be this, that, or the other. Whatever you believe, whatever faith that you embrace, it does not matter as long as you are sincere. Well, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So we need to have uh, allegiance to Christ. And so today we're here as we continue to ask this question, the plaguing question, what is the big deal? What is the big deal as it relates to faith? More specifically, to New Testament faith. Yeah. We want to kind of camp out right there today because there are many who say Faith is this and faith is that. And there are many misconceptions about what faith is all about. What is faith? And so the purpose of this lesson 
is that we understand the difference between mere faith and saving faith. See, you can have faith in a lot of things. But your faith is validated by the object of your faith. If Jesus is the object of your faith, then that faith is a sure foundation. And I want us to understand that uh, as we embrace the fact that we are saved by grace through faith, we might engage in works of faith. I don't want to get that twisted. I'm going to say it again. You see, we're not saved by our works of merit. We're not saved by our works of law keeping. We're not saved because we got 100% on every spelling test. That's right. We cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's. No, that's not why we're saved. No. Why not? It's not based on our own performance, mm -hmm. but it's based on God's performance that's right. in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, I think we must have some kind of contextual framework in which we broach this subject of New Testament faith. Knowing that faith is used some, one, some 240 times in the New Testament as a noun. Mm -hmm. Faith is used some over 240 times in the New Testament as a verb. And some 67 times as an adjective. So I believe just based on the number of uses of the word in its different forms, help us to kind of grasp the fact that it has some significance for us. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews 11th chapter, which helps us to have a, an understanding and a grasp on the significance of faith. For it says, now faith is, when I said faith is used as a noun many times, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith becomes uh, the solid ground that you can stand on. It becomes your foundation on which you build your house. Faith is the substance. See, faith is your ability to see what you can't see. Faith is your ability to reach out and touch what's not there. Faith said, I understand it, I, I see it, I possess it, even though I don't have it right now. That's right. That's right. We serve on the God of, of the uh, right now and the not yet. Yes. Don't we? Yes. We serve a God of the right now. Yes. He promises us blessings right now. Amen. But sometimes he has to say, not yet. Yes. So we have a, an assurance that God will provide everything. Even when I'm at the last, I'm at the end of my supply. I trust God to give me everything that I need. As a matter of fact, I already got it. Amen. I need cash the check. Amen. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So therefore it begs the question, what is saving faith? What is saving faith? If it is indeed true that the Bible tells us in verse 5 of Hebrews 11, it was by faith that Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him. Watch this. Ah, but before the translation. He said before his translation, he had his testimony that he pleased God. So what is saving faith? The Bible says, but without faith. Now, I want to make sure we understand that different components are expressions of faith. There is saving faith, in other words, faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then there are works of faith, which we who are now believers. As we, by faith, trust in the finished work of Jesus, we enter into that covenant partnership 
by virtue of our relationship and position in Jesus Christ. By faith, now we merge from that relationship, by virtue of that relationship, to now engage in works of faith. Some would look at that and say, well, the Bible says uh, that we are saved by faith but not works. And I think the Apostle Paul was very clear on that. Yes. But then why would I say that I am saved by my works, James? I don't think James and Paul are in disagreement. That's right. Come on. I think we need to understand the difference between one trying to work to be saved and one working because he is saved. That's right. Come on. Amen. All right. Notice. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Amen. Number one, he says, for he that cometh to God, if you want to come to God, there are some prerequisites there. You deserve to go, you don't just come. You won't even desire to come. Come on now. Unless you believe that he exists. Amen. Now, Notice, when I said faith is used as a noun, but then it's also used as a verb. Mm -hmm. The same word that we see in Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, pistis is the word. Right. Uh, it says, but now he that cometh must believe. believe. That's faith used in the verb form. Uh -huh. Pistuo, same root word. But now it's being used as a verb. See, a verb is an action word. Mm -hmm. So you must believe not only that he exists or that he is, but also that he is a rewarder to the, of those who do what? Yeah. Diligently yeah. seek him. Right. So if we have a heart to seek him, we'll find him. Amen. So I want to begin to talking about man's ultimate goal. You see, we have a lot of goals, hopes, dreams, and aspirations in life, don't we? Right. Don't we? Yes. We, don't, we don't just, you know, we just born and wait until we die, no. We have goals. We have different things that we want to aspire to. Whether it's to provide for your children, whether it's to get a certain status in life, whatever it is, we have goals. Nothing wrong with that. But in this text, we understand that man's ultimate goal is to please God. Amen. Enoch was translated, but his testimony was that he pleased God. We all want to please God. The Bible says, in order to please God, you must have something. A certain component necessary if you want to please God. He said, for without this component, it's impossible to please Him. And that component is faith. Amen. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Now, I, this is not my sermon, but I think sometimes we find ourselves walking by sight and not by faith. Amen. Everything we do is based on what we see we're able to do. Amen. If it's not within our budget, we just won't do it. Right. If it's not within our you know, realm of possibility, we won't even try it. If we can't conceive it, we can't achieve it. But God has given us the ability. He's given us that something necessary uh, to go beyond our capability. Right. And that is our faith in God. Right. Without it, it is impossible to please Him. Notice the first prerequisite of saving faith is it's a mental ascent. It's a mental ascent. Again, the text says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You need to believe in the existence of God. And I know humanism and, and man philosophy try to explain away the very existence of God. Come on. We go to our fine universities and they take great pains to tell you that there's no such thing as God. But you see, there's something that God has deposited in man. And it's a longing 
a longing for that relationship. That relationship that God established, even in the garden. God gives us uh, a, a longing to be filled <coughs> with that relationship. God gives us, He gives us purpose. And your ultimate purpose, and your ultimate goal, is to establish that wholesome, healthy, harmonious relationship with your Creator. Amen. And so, faith is a mental ascent, a mental act, understanding and acknowledging the fact that God does exist. Faith is an attitude thereby. It's an attitude whereby man will not abandon all of his reliance on his own efforts. See, we, 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 we buy into this notion that I got this. I got this. I can do this. And we find ourselves endeavoring to accomplish only the things that we are able to do. Help us now. Under our own power. Help. And so therefore the church becomes somewhat anemic, anemic. and crippled Cripple. because we never move outside the realm of human possibility. Help us now. And we find ourselves only doing the things that we can do. Mm. But if, it's, if you do the things that only you can do, what do you need God for? Right. See, we glorify God when we do the things that we can't do. That's right. The things that are impossible for us. Yeah. That cause us to rely and depend on Him. So therefore, faith, faith is uh, that acknowledgement that He is there, that He exists. But then it turns to an attitude where by I abandon all of my reliance on my own efforts to obtain salvation. I don't care how good your deeds are. You can give away Girl Scout cookies. You can mow other people's lawn. You can walk little old ladies across the street. All that's good. All that stuff is good. But in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not based on what you can do. It's based on what he's already done. Amen. Notice what the Bible says in the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 21 and following. It says, uh, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, That's right now. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's right. Have we not cast out demons or devils in your name? Have we not done many, many wonderful things and wonderful work in your name? So this passage helps me to understand that these folks, you know what they were? These were Sunday go meet folk. <laughs> oh, yes. Because they acknowledge, they acknowledge uh, Jesus as Lord. And then they went on to say that we've been preaching and teaching in your name. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not spoke forth the word in your name? Have we not been doing all those things? We have established, you know, ministries that are designed to cast out devils. I ain't getting no amen on that. You remember what I mean by that? In other words, we have established this ministry to these people who are uh, shocked by the demon of drug possession. That's right. And they are not in their right mind. Amen. And we've established these ministries that have not delivered them from that. We have a uh, different ministry for battered women or, or battered husbands. And we, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> we don't talk to you how to stop beating up your husband. We don't, we don't talk to you how to work with your finances. And all these good ministries. But they were doing all that good stuff. However, they had not rendered obedience to the gospel, the New Testament faith, as outlined in the Word of God. Right. See, we can find ourselves in the broad way of religion when we listen to the philosophy and the commandments of men. I abandon all of my security in my own ethical goodness. Realizing that faith is an attitude of complete trust in Christ. Amen. Of reliance 
on Christ and on Christ alone for all that salvation needs. But not only that, but the second prerequisite is not only to have the faith that God exists, it's also the belief uh, that he rewards those who seek him. Yes. Saving faith then has a corresponding action. A corresponding action. In other words, the Bible says, by faith, uh, Enoch was translated. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. That's right. If you want to know if Noah had faith, all you need to do is look out in his backyard and see that big boat that he built it. There's no water, right. no forecast rain. But if you want to know the depth of his faith, look at that big boat he built it. Right. Notice the Bible says that faith, Abraham left his father and his father's country looking for a land that he didn't know where he was going. But he knew that God knew where he was sending him. Right. By faith, the Bible says that Sarah conceived. See, uh, by faith, we understand that Rahab was delivered when all of those who did not believe were slaughtered when Joshua uh, fought the battle of Jericho. Right. Faith then is the substance, the very foundation of what you hope for. The Bible says that all these died in faith. They did not see the fulfillment of their promise. But I'm told that old Jacob, Jacob was a man of faith. That's right. And he blessed, he blessed uh, uh, the people. Mm -hmm. Even when they were out to get him, his faithfulness in God persevered. But notice, notice on his dying bed, he talked about the promise that was made uh, to his father, Isaac and Abraham. He, he knew, he by faith, he knew that although he had been made a prince of Egypt, had been elevated to a position of prominence in Egypt, by faith he knew that this was not his own. I don't know how much he knew about the upcoming captivity and enslavement of his people. I don't know how much he knew about the deliverance that was going to come some 400 years later. But even before they went into captivity on his dying bed, he said, this is not our home. By faith, he saw another place. He said, now, when you leave here, when you leave this place, I'm going with you. I'm going to go to that land where I'm back. I'm going to the promised land. By faith, I can see the promised land. Don't leave me. Take my bones if I don't make it. If I die while I'm here, don't bury me in Egyptian soil. Keep me preserved. When you leave, take me with you. Take my bones with you to the promised land. He had a faith that God could deliver. What kind of faith do you have today? Do you have a faith that whatever ministry you're involved in, that God can make you flourish and grow? Do you believe, if you're not a Christian, do you believe that God exists? Yeah. Do you believe that God rewards you if you seek Him? Right. Do you believe that He sent His Son to pay the way back to God? Yeah. All faith is important that we have this kind of faith. Faith has a corresponding action. So not only is it a mental assent that there is a God, but it also says, now I'm going to diligently seek Him. Because if I seek, I shall find. Man's ultimate goal is to please God. Man's ultimate challenge, therefore, is accepting Jesus as Lord in Christ. Can you accept Jesus uh, as the Messiah, as the Master? Jesus said, why call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? If you love me, he said, then you do what? And we keep his commandments. 
through faith. Amen. Motivated by our love for him. Appreciating his love for us. See, man's ultimate requirement then is to trust Jesus for salvation. And if you trust Jesus for salvation, the corresponding activity will be you will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, I'll leave yeah, Jesus Christ in the God. Yeah, right. It's more than that. That faith has to express itself in your actions. You see, the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is so interwoven with the complete revelation of God that when it is accepted as true, when you can accept that, then all the facts and commands and promises of the Bible are thereby accepted as well. So therefore, if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Amen. if you believe that Jesus died for your sin, that he was buried and rose again the third day, and therefore he offers you that eternal life if you will accept the condition for his pardon of your sins. If you believe that, repenting of your sin won't be a big deal. Confessing him as Lord won't be a big deal. Being buried in the water and the grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins won't be a big deal when you accept Jesus for who he is. Amen. All everything else falls in the lap. Amen. Sometimes we just don't believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He's indeed Lord of our lives. Notice, notice, saving faith, therefore, is an acceptance of truth about Christ and compliance to his conditions for entrance into that new life in Christ Jesus. You can't have one and not the other. That's why the Bible says, uh, he that believeth and is baptized. He that believeth and repents. He that believeth and confesses. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But it goes on there, first of all, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Your belief will have a corresponding activity in your repentance. Your belief will have a corresponding activity in your confessing him as Lord. Your belief will have a corresponding action of you being buried in the water of the grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. Because by faith, you know that when you obey from the heart that pattern of teaching, then you become free from sin. Notice. So what is saving faith? It is the element by which we believe God. But not only that, there are some obstacles to faith. What are the obstacles to saving faith? I want to invite you to turn with me to the text that was written in here. No, that wasn't the introduction. That was... <laughs> But I want you to turn to John, John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, we see verse 24 through 26. Something interesting has taken place. And I want to kind of point this out to help us to really grasp the intent of this message. See, because faith it's perfected through your works. See, James says, before we do this, James says, James says, if your faith is not perfected in works, he said, that's really not faith. You know what he calls it? He said, that's dead faith. He goes a little further in, in, in James 2 and 18. He says, he said, the demons or the devil Come on now. believe Amen. Amen. to the point that they even shudder. They trembled as my brother over here said. They believe. But what are they say? <laughs> See, saving faith is a faith that is backed up by what you do. Amen. Notice what the Bible says. Um, in John chapter 6, verse 29. 6, 29. John 6, 29. Jesus says, because many people say that baptism is a work. So therefore, you know, baptism is not in the equation of salvation. 
But in John chapter 20 and verse number 29, Jesus says that the work of God is believing on Christ. So faith itself is the work of God. So when we believe, when we have faith, we're just uh, believing in the work of God. And everything that is corresponding from faith is a result of our trusting in the work of God. <coughs> faith. Faith. Saving faith is a faith that understands the proposition that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it also responds through humble obedience Amen. to that God. Amen. If he's indeed Lord of your life. Amen. Now, obstacles of faith. Now, notice in this text, Jesus has risen. He's risen. Verse number, uh, 23 says, whoever sins, well, let me go for the first, I want to get this to you. Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection, right? We know that Mary had entered into the tomb and he wasn't there. She went back and told the disciples and all that uh, had taken place, right? And so the Bible says in verse 19, that the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And he said, Peace be unto you. And he talked about receiving the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, Whosoever sins you remit, they should be remitted. Unto them, whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Mm -hmm. And this is the part I want to get to, verse 24. But Thomas, but Thomas, one of the twelve, by the way, mm -hmm. this Thomas, don't get it confused with anybody else, he's one of the twelve. Uh, one called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. That's right. Oh, really? He displayed, number one, a reactionary spirit. Why, Thomas, were you not there? Mm -hmm. This was the first day of the week. This was a time when, notice, all the other ones were there mm -hmm. together. Right. But he wasn't. Uh -oh. We all know that initially they were scattered when Jesus was arrested. Right. Thomas, Thomas uh, had a forsaken the assembly. <laughs> Notice his reactionary spirit. It was a spirit of sin and guilt that led to doubt and frustration. Why weren't you there? Thomas had forsaken the Lord. Thomas had withdrawn from the other believers. Evidenced by the fact that he wasn't there. Notice what the Bible was going to say. After he had withdrawn from them and he had forsaken the Lord and he was not there, he missed out on his opportunities to experience the glory and the appearance of Jesus. Amen. See, when you forsake this, this is not my message, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, when you forsake the assembly of yourself and the other saints, don't you know that Jesus said, when, when, when you gather to worship and to pray in me, I'm there with you. Amen. I'm in your midst. Do you believe that Jesus is here today? Do you believe that Jesus is in the very midst of his people present? Well then, why is it so often that many consistently, without any regard, just forsake the assembly of themselves together? Now, let me get into this text. I don't want to get into that too much, but I'm glad I said it. Thomas was not there. Now, the twelve mm -hmm. disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Mm -hmm. When you look at that in the Greek construction, he said, they, they kept on telling him. They were, they were, they were convinced, you know, we've seen the Lord over and over again. He appeared to us. We saw him and, you know, we were blessed. And he said this and he said that, explaining this phenomenon, this, this episode of, of rapture and splendor that they had now experienced in the presence of the risen Lord. 
But you see, when you're not there, you miss out. He missed the blessing. He missed the encouragement. He missed the chance for reconciliation. Right. And therefore, when you miss out on something, or you can call it, you know, someone, you know, you missed your, you missed your blessing. And by the way, sometimes we miss our blessings. That's right. Oh, yes. When you fail to obey God, God has some blessings in store for you. Because I believe, I believe based on the, the accuracy of the word of God, that God has blessings for us. Amen. I believe mean, God wants to bless you. Amen. He wants to bless all of us. Amen. Sometimes he has blessings in store for you, but sometimes we miss. We miss our blessings. Yes. Because of our inability to, to show up and to be where the blessings are. Amen. See, God puts the blessings uh, where you ought to be. He won't put the blessings over in crack house, you're not going to be there. He doesn't put the blessings in a place that you were last night when you should have been. Sometimes we miss our blessings. Church, it breaks my heart. I see so many of us missing out on the blessings of God. Thomas missed out by virtue of his uh, behavior. Now, here's the thing now. I want you to get this. He said to them, I don't care what you say, I'm not going to believe you. Right. Come on now. You can argue with me. You can say everything you want to say, but except I see it for myself, I won't believe. <laughs> well, you could have saw it for yourself and you were seeing where you're supposed to be. Right. But sometimes the guilt of our Missing the mark. See, sin is a tricky thing. Yes, sir. Help us. See, sin Help us. Can, can take you, up, put you on a slippery slope. That's right. When you sin, the first thing you do is you become, you know, guilty. Yeah. That's right. Guilty. And then you begin to look around and see how you can avoid the guilt. Right. You begin to transfer blame to somebody else. Right. Yeah, God, you know, this woman you gave me. Yeah, I said, that was your fault, God. You should have to give it to me. Don't laugh at that, please. Because sometimes when you get caught in your sin, you start talking about everybody else. That's right. You know? I can't say, listen, doing something. First thing she won't tell me about truth. I can't say, I said, truth, what you do? Well, listen. And you guys do, you do it too. You know, my preaching was good, would be great if I had somebody say amen. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm coming on down the line. The choir would be this and that. We can only have people to show up and be committed and, and all that kind of stuff. If I can get the ushers to, to, to be on point, if I can get the, the greeters to greet, if I had the teachers to teach, if I had the singers to sing, whatever. Right. You never own up to our responsibility. We begin to cast blame on everybody else. Amen. And Thomas was one who began to have this, crit this, this critique and this critical response. He said, you know, I, I'm not going to believe except I'm able to see him for myself. And he went on a little bit further. And unless, even if I do see him, I'm not going to believe. I want to have a post-examination to make sure you're real. I want to see his hands when they, when they, when they pierced his, his hands. Uh, with that big spike, I want to be able to look at it and examine it for myself. I want to put my hand in it. Right. When I see his side, I want to be able to, to, to thrust my hand or poke his finger in it and thrust my hand in it. If you can't show me that, if you can't put up, you might as well. <laughs> and after eight days, in other words, for a whole week, he had this Obstinate, right. stiff necked, right. rebellious right. attitude. Right. Until the first day of the week came back again. Uh -oh. We have to understand they had began to have a pattern. Jesus didn't come throughout the week. He had to deal with the thing. He said some eight days later. Again, his disciples were within. But this time, Thomas was with them. Right. And Jesus, I like it. Jesus 
I came. The door is being shut. He just, he just appeared, appeared in the midst. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the appearance of the Lord? We in heaven meet and we argue about this, that, or the other, something trivial, of no real, real consequence. Right. We split the church right. over heads. Right. Won't get out. Won't knock on the door. Might break a nail. Right. Won't pass out a fire. <laughs> Won't do nothing. Pass extra. Play for us. What are you asking us for that for? Whatever. I'm not saying that if you did, I would watch it though. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, when we find ourselves with a sinful attitude, it brings guilt, guilt and criticism and all that kind of thing. But then Jesus showed up. He showed up. And when he showed up, uh, he immediately called Thomas out. Sometimes you got to call folk out. Amen. He called him out. He said, Thomas, I want to talk to you. He said, you come over here. Thomas was all surprised and ready to eat cheese and all that kind of stuff. No, no, come right here. Start the center. You see, I heard you when you made those statements. See, sometimes we talk a good talk, like Job, but then when God confronts us, uh -oh. uh -huh. he said, no, go ahead, go ahead. I heard you say, except you do this and the other. Come on. And notice what Thomas said. Notice what Thomas said. When Jesus said, reach that finger and behold my hand and reach uh, thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believe. Notice, the Bible don't say that he did any of that. It is that he just answered and said, my Lord and my God. The great confession that Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. That Jesus is God he came in a human body. He, he put on flesh. In other words, he, put, he pitched his tent. Right, right. The Bible says he, he, he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. He pitched his tent. Using Old Testament uh, 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 imagery, he pitched his tent right. in human flesh for the purpose of not only revealing God, but to satisfy the righteous requirement of God. Amen. In other words, the great exchange took place. That's why he came in, in flesh. To perform the great exchange. For God made him who knew no sin. To become sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Through him. Amen. He took on our sin and in exchange he gave us his righteousness. And so, there's another reason for this kind of rebellious spirit. Or the obstacles of faith. And that is simply this. Sometimes we have a false picture of Jesus. Yeah. He's, you know, faith to accept Jesus as the Son of God uh, can cause you to reject everything else about God. Notice, we talked about this the other day. When Jesus was on the coast of Caesarea field of pie, and he was walking with his disciples, he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then they began to give all of these logical answers, right? Some say that John the Baptist, some say you are Elias, some say you are Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. No, they all have exalted him to a high position. Right. A prophet. Yes. Not good enough. <laughs> See, many will say that Jesus was a prophet. Many will say that Jesus was a master teacher. Many will say that Jesus was a good man. Many will venture to say that Jesus was the greatest man who ever lived. You believe that's true? Yeah. It's true, but it's not good enough. That's right. You've got to transcend this humanity. So, I mean, so, so often we want to bring Jesus down to our level. Help us now. We want to make him just a man. He's a good man. He's a great man. He's the greatest man who ever lived. Right. But that doesn't cut it. That's not good enough. Unless you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Unless you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. He's Jesus. Jehovah saves. Emmanuel. God with us. Unless you believe that he is indeed God in a human body. You've missed it. And this misconception 
will cause you to falter along the way. See, man, we want to bring him down to our level. Jesus is more than a great man. Jesus is God who became a man in order to redeem man from his sins. Right. And through his vicarious or substitutionary death, he died in substitute for you. He died in substitute for you right. and you and you. For all of us, he died this substitutionary death on Calvary's cross to take on our sin and therefore give us his righteousness. And so uh, this persistent doubt that followed uh, Thomas, I will not believe. You cannot believe uh, what's true and what's false at the same time. You need a confrontation. You need a confrontation with Jesus. Only a confrontation with Jesus uh, could take care of his persistent doubt. It kind of reminds me of a man who was on the road to Damascus. He was so persistent in his uh, uh, desire to persecute the church. That's right. He was on the road to Damascus. Everybody who was a member of the faith, member of the church, was scared to talk to him. That's right. Brother Barry, well, you kind of, how do you know that? Because the Bible says God told Ananias. Uh, that he that saw go away. Yeah. I want you to go preach to him. He said, What? Mm -hmm. See, God, have you read the newspaper? Yeah. <laughs> have you wrote, read the, the Jerusalem Gazette? Yeah. How, how this guy is, is, is persecuting the church? Yeah, yeah. All the Christians were scared of him. Yeah. But he had an encounter. Thomas had an encounter. You need to have an encounter. Man. With Jesus. Amen. See, when you have an encounter with Jesus, your life will never be the same. Amen. You can't get baptized and go about your business. Man. See, the Bible says the Ethiopian got baptized and he went away rejoicing because of his encounter with Jesus. That's right. uh, the Apostle Paul says, I count all my past life as lost because of my encounter with Jesus. Finally, let me just get this to you and, and let you have it and be on your way. As we look at the obstacles, let me say what produces saving faith. Quickly, the Bible says that many of the many of the miracles that Jesus did, many of the signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing, you might have life in his name. You see, the gospel message is designed to produce saving faith, which results in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. The Christian faith, which is obedient faith, by the way, not simply a mental assent, but a mental assent with a corresponding action of obedience, it results in life. Let me talk, talk about the great facts about Jesus. First of all, we've already said that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've already said that he came for a purpose, to redeem man from his sin. He came with a passion. He died on the cross. They call it the passion of Christ. Enduring the suffering of death for you and I. And then now he gives us the privilege of sonship in the kingdom of God. Not only do we have the great fact, we have the great purpose for the gospel. Notice the text says, now many other signs Jesus did. Right. Now John extracted a few, a few signs, a few discourses, and compiled them in this book to produce saving faith. Oh, there are many other things that Jesus did that are not even written in this book. But the purpose of these signs being recorded in this book, we call the Gospel of John, is to produce saving faith. A saving faith which has a great result, obedience to the Gospel. When you obey the Gospel, you have life, eternal life. We call it salvation. Let me just say this. We talk about saving faith. Faith is the motivating power behind every act we perform in obedience to Christ. Whether it's your repentance, your confession, or your baptism. Mm -hmm. It's all a result of your faith. Faith is that which gives meaning 
to each and every act of obedience. God did not save us because of our works of merit, but because of our faith being strong enough to do what he commanded us to do. Amen. See, if you believe in God, if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, it's no big deal for you to comply with God's conditions for pardon. Right. So when we ask the question, what is the big deal about saving faith? Your faith has everything to do with your relationship with God. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot obey the gospel. Without faith, you can't walk uh, the Christian walk. Without faith, there is nothing you can do. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the very evidence of things not seen. For without it, it is impossible to please God. Amen. Do you have faith today? Amen. If you have faith,